Good evening and welcome to Helene Johnson and the Harlem Renaissance, the first in a series of conversations that celebrate pioneering Boston women poets and the large and embracing radius of their creative and generative activity. Tonight, to quote the final line in a recently discovered draft by Johnson, we welcome all strangers and all beginnings. This event is, of course, a celebration of a singular artist, but it is also an exploration of communities that accrue and ideas that are catalyzed through the intimate relationship of artists, family members, friends, neighbors, readers, and beyond. Be they the artists that congregated in the Harlem of the 1920s, or on the vineyard in the 30s and 40s, or in the village of the 70s and 80s, or on the internet of 2021, when during the height of the pandemic, a longtime neighbor of Johnson's, Matt Imperial, reached out to Abigail McGrath by email to inform her that he had just unearthed over a hundred pages of her mother's poems and drafts in a box at the base of a long unopened armoire. A fact that I serendipitously intersected with when, around the same time, I wrote to Abigail to learn more about the Renaissance House Writing Residency, which she founded over 20 years ago in her mother's honor at the home of her aunt, Dorothy West. All of which reminds me how a poet once defined meaning itself as, quote, the gathering of former tenants. Tonight, we gather around the hearth of this great work and shine renewed light on the life of this great woman. Before our oral history begins, we'll open with a few poems of Johnson's read by two tremendous Boston-based and or Boston-born poets, Tracy K. Smith and Eileen Miles, who will read in that order. Please welcome former U.S. Poet Laureate and current Harvard faculty member, Tracy K. Smith. Thank you so much. I am uh, so delighted to be taking part in this event and I'm excited to kind of like sit and enjoy, but I am really, really grateful to be able to bring, um, bring Helene's voice into the room with this poem, Time After Time, which I think is just such a miraculous portrait of an aging self, um, a, a, a woman that ages with appetite with irreverence, with passion, with humor. Um, time after time. Time after time, there is a once upon a time. Old woman waiting for the bus, nervous in the sliced line, fumbling your ID card, listening hard to some inner meager bard. Someone will stand, Steady your hand. Thank you so much. Not at all, ma'am. Their eyes do not see you. You understand. They subscribe to the alive, the me too's, the wits, the next, the flexible. You are invisible to the dimensioned. You've become petulant. The tea is never right. At night, the lack, the looking back, the constant reminiscence wrinkling the brow of now, the defensive rigidness, the blinkless stare, the tired decisions and revisions. Where did forgiveness go? The gentleness, the warm and generous hello. We'll have tea and day old cinnamon buns, do come. It need not be that way, old woman. Skip the lonely flicks. Mix, tremble the air, resemble, declare, inhale, exhale, blare, blare loudly, louder than the crowd. Ignore the meek, they have no fervor. They die from murmured violence, littered silences. They die at ends of cues, mewing, waiting, waiting in good faith, unembittered. Time is a roll of dimes bought at the carnival. Dimes for the wines, no free wines, each wind a dime. Wind the wheels of chance, wind the little porno films and the belly dolls that dance. Wind the wax soothsayer and the imprinted prayers. Wind until the springs break. Catch the sweet cascade, prepaid, mechanically made the nectar and ambrosia, 
the syrupy nostalgia, the orange aid, the grape aid, the lemonade, the limeade. Drink up. Crush the paper cup and let it quiver to the floor. Old woman, gulp the joy. Belch the pity. Straddle the city. Thank you. Please welcome the one and only Eileen Miles. Hi, you got quite an applause there, Tracy. That was amazing. I love it. Um, you know, I, I'm so happy to be taking part in this and I'm really happy that I heard Tracy read first because like poems don't get born until we hear them. And I, I was excited to, that we're hearing the same poet. It's, it's really something. Um, and I was in Boston for a month in 2016, and I was writing an essay about Boston. And I, I came to the Woodbury to do re research, in particular, about poets with Boston accents. And um, and as I was going through, you know, John Wieners, and um, I was like, Christina, aren't there are they aren't there any writers of color who are from Boston in the lot in the collection here and who are from Boston and and lo I was I was introduced to um, Helene Johnson who I think it's so exciting that she changed she changed her name when she moved to New York but a Boston poet who went to New York and and sublet Zora Neale Hurston's apartment I mean it just the, the story is so good but the the poems right away were so exciting to me and in part they were so improper and, and vernacular and just um, really just wildly full of life. And so I found this um, poem that I'm going to read from uh, the boat is tethered to the floor and which was in the lost and found pamphlet. And I've, I've it's not the whole poem because it's, it's a little longer than what I'm reading, but I'm reading as much as I can in this moment. Um, so I'm just going to jump in. Come barefoot and ungloved, bring friendliness, less fragile and more versatile than love. And do not harness me to promises, let us reach separately in each other's arms. Unpen the wind, begin at the beginning, beginning spin, any beginning. If I could touch your garment, would I be calmed? If you could savor me in your arms, I'm disturbed by words not clearly heard promises of. How many... How may I reach you and know love? Where is the source, the toppled force, the once upon a time? What will I find? Peace, fear, or the same threaded conclusions I find here? Ah, for a higher degree of together we, especially we, are morally tired of me, finally. Hoist me Allah while I am moist in a jar. So this is the spa, the delicious ah, kelp from the sea helps you to... Whelp the facsimile of yourself. Take the Chinese and amazing people. Nourished by kelp for generations, they are discreetly prolific. Eat what they eat. Their size does not make them fertile and wise. It is their diet. Sur surmise. Try it. Never harness me to a promise. Leave me unfastened. I woke up alone. The pillow in my arms did not stir. Tomorrow will I wake instead. Your tangled hair damp on the bed and the pillow wet with sweat, breathing on the floor. Love swings like a tavern sign without the mind. How do you feel about things? How absolute, how deluded? I must know before I dive into your sea. I, me, I equal my together. Why? I'm tired of saying I, I want to say we. It's not that I'm lonely, only I'm tired of being just me. I'm tired of putting me first in each verse. Arguments won before they're begun. Me and me always agree. What a tiresome bore I must be. Me, get away from me. Remove your hex from me. Oh, for an us or a let's. Nothing complex, a choice, another voice. What's your point of view? Or let's warm up the stew. Or what can we do next? Or any old let's. For instance, when I raided the fridge, the drumstick still there, the milk and the pie and the cheese still there, nothing missing. And what fun is cindering the toast and burning the roast with no one to fuss like if I was part of an us. A good fight's nice before dousing the light. I could weep bris blissfully while we made up, but with no daring offender or brazen and surrender, what could occur that I'd care to remember? So I will sleep wistfully with a shade up dangerously derangedly. 
I am sick of me, sick, sick. There was more pith and with than this without. I wonder, did the pigeons come today and did they fly away? And when they found I wasn't there, I wonder, did the sparrows come to play and weave their nests from combings of my hair? They'll miss the window where we shared our crumbs. The thing is done. The folding walls are still and bare. I wonder, did the pigeons come? Most winged things smell farewell. They came. I think they knew. I think they cared. If you have someone to weep for, you are blessed. If you bring a child, another's grief, a new belief close, you are blessed. And when you seem again, it will not be the same, for you will know a little more of everything. Shy, you sing. Either boy, everything is somehow reverent and irreverent, a quandary of becauses. I love you because I don't love you because I can't love you because love conceives. The pith of love is love is love is love conceives. To evolve a fitting little boy, we must revolve an innocent, benevolent intent. Love is the embraced extent, the signature, everything that breathes, conceives, simply reason, believe, no, we have a little boy, not a symbolic little boy, but a colicky, burping, belching little boy, as real as porridge. Don't bother to be horrified. May I be a mother too, made in your image, or would that cause a holy scrimmage? Is there a seesaw or leavening in heaven? You heard me screaming. You didn't miss a scream. Now it is too late. What were you waiting for? This... Thank you, Tracy and Eileen, for reviving Helene's voice. Uh, it's an honor to welcome Professor Werner D. Mitchell, who has worked so steadfastly to research and publish Helene's work over the years. He has generously agreed to moderate tonight's conversation with Abigail McGrath. Uh, McGrath, oh, sorry. Their bios are posted in the Zoom chat. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Abigail. Uh, I'd like to begin with a question about the recent growing interest in your mother's poetry. You've said, and I quote, she is finally getting what she always wanted, attention to the work, and not the person, uh, end of quote. I confess that I'd also like to know more uh, about the person. Can you share a couple of stories about your mother, things that aren't widely known? For example, what were some of her most defining personality traits, idiosyncratic habits, passions, pastimes, uh, et cetera? Abigail, you just need to unmute, sorry. Yeah, I just got hey. that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, Can, I wanna speak to Eileen a little tiny bit and then I'll, I'll answer your question. Sure. Because, because I, Eileen talked about the uh, Boston poets, and Helen, my mother, Helen, <laughs> Helen, came to New York, and uh, because it was so exciting. But the key thing is that when um, when they oh golly when they separated themselves from the other writers at the time, they would do what we call putting on the Boston, and it was putting on that Boston accent that separated them from the other writers. And, and one big deal was that uh, they, they were at the opportunity um, dinner, some, they were serving soda or something and they asked for tonic because that's the Boston's tonic, right? Totally and everybody awesome. fell at that. And so they were just so embarrassed that they were eating, you know, hastings, but um, uh, it was just, you know, a, a memorable thing. And, and the other one is, Helen didn't change her name. Dorothy's mother changed her name. Oh. Dorothy's mother, uh, Rachel, had took care. There were three of them, all born within one year. Dorothy West, the writer, my mother, Helen Johnson, and Jean Rickson, the pretty one. And um, <laughs> when they went to New York, she told them three things. Don't let them know how old you are. Let, lie about your age before, you know, so they won't bother you. And um, stay at the Y, because you'll be protected. And Helen, change your name to Helene, because it'll be Helene the Queen. And she did. 
So that's uh, <laughs> well. That's why she changed your name. Okay. So what idiosyn? You want um, what idiom? Idiosyncratic uh, type uh, stories about Helen. Give me a give me a subject, and I'll give you a story. I, it's hard to do it. Um, let me think. Okay. Um, no, oh, here's a good one. Uh, <laughs> we. Um, I never knew I was poor. I always thought we were broke. And at Christmas time, we would not get our Christmas tree until all the other Christmas trees had been sold and they had gone home. And so, uh, and they were on the street, right? And Helen said, okay, we're gonna do the good thing here. We're gonna rescue these trees that are on the street and take them home. And so we take, these straggly old nasty looking trees, we I mean, like two, two or three of them and, and, and take them home and wrap them up and make them look like a real tree. And I didn't know until I was married and had children and I made my husband do it. When I got married, cause I thought, you know, that's what, that's Christmas. That's what we do, that's our tradition. Um, I didn't know until hmm, 50 or so, that was because we didn't have any money. It's just there. So um, covering up, not covering up, that's the wrong word. Making them, making lemonade, I think is the way people, normal people would say, a lemon would, would be her best, the best thing. I'm sorry, I forgot the question. You might want to mention, you might want to mention about how she liked to be alone. Like- Oh, that's, would, uh, that's Helen's grandson, right? My son, Jason, yeah. is her grandson. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so oh. here we go, all right. So, oh, this is a good one also. Okay, so when Helen was um, younger, uh, they, all three of the girls stayed with Rachel and the other two mothers went out. My grandmother was a practical nurse and the other one was, I don't know, some kind of domestic thing. And so they, they worked outside of the house. Oh, God, Jason. Oh, oh, oh. And then, okay, so Helen's mother would leave and her name was Daughter because she was the oldest daughter of 18. And Helen would look out the window and see her walk away until she disappeared. And then she would turn around and there would be the wicked Rachel. And so Rachel was so terrible to live with that she kept the windows open all the time so that it would be cold in her room and that Rachel would not come in as much as, as she did. Um, and, and, and that was her salvation. And that's like you girls, that's how she got a chance to write <laughs> underneath the covers, but you know, it was like worth it, sorry. And, and, and in Martha's Vineyard, she, she'd go to write in the cemetery so no one would come and bother her. That's true. Being, and, and she writes about loneliness a lot um, and, and being singular and, uh, the, the poem that uh, Tracy read uh, was based on a French film. I forgot what it's called, The little, Lonely Old Lady, some terrific French film about a sweet little old lady who, who changed her life when she realized that she was old and nobody noticed her. And she became a communist and she started making movies and she had this whole new life once she realized that she was invisible. Uh, and Helen, oh, Helen, realized she was invisible. Okay, this is hard to say. There's two sides to this. Um, there's a kind of arrogance, okay. Shy, 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 terribly shy, but there's a kind of arrogance to that kind of shy. And actually, Eileen um, picked it up in a funny kind of way, because when people would come to interview her, she would say, oh, no, 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 like Greta Garbo, right? But she was expecting people to come knock down, knock the door, come inside, find her, and say, "Come on, you know." Uh, so, uh, so being alone, she didn't like it, but she chose it, and and it comes from that um, that kind of wicked. Not wicked is the wrong word, and and the child in which you're never happy, and and. And it's true, you could say, well, she had her own room, what's she complaining about? But, but not having your mother is difficult. And having someone else's mother is even worse. 
Okay, I got one more. She, there's three of them, right? And Rachel tells the three of them that she's their mother. And Helen says, well, if you're my mother, who's that woman walking away? So that's your other mother. She really loved you to stay here. So, you know, that, that gets you when you get older. And, um, and being like alone is something that I can't take. And I'm only just alone a couple of years now. But uh, it, is, it, it, it plays on my, loneliness is something that is hard to get over. So it's, it's, what's important the to know, it's important to know that they lived in Back Bay and that, that your grandmother worked in Brookline. So it was uh, at those days quite a- Yeah, you know. right, that's right. And also in the video, but then I had some, I'm sorry, Vern, I, did, I didn't mean to keep going on, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, that, that, that's wonderful, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, another question. Uh, in a poignant essay called Nella Larson, you describe oh. the circumstances of your birth, especially as they're related to the discriminatory practices of the hospital your mother went to. Could you recount some of that remarkable story for our audience? Sure. Nella looked like white, if I may just say it out loud. And there's a film right now called Passing. Well, it was white. Come on, any other country, she would be white. One was Danish. Were you kidding around? Her father's West Indian. Um, uh, I think Langston wrote a poem about it, Neither Black Nor White. I'm not sure if it's about Nella, but it, it should be. Um, mm, when Nella was older than all the girls. And so, uh, and divorce, and, and <laughs> Nella had quite a background. <laughs> Nella had a terrific background. And, um, and, and she had a safety net, which you guys don't have. I'm talking about Tracy and I, and she was a nurse, okay? She had that back, she had something to fall back on. And went, uh, and also, oh no, okay, oh my God. Okay, so Nella at the beginning was big time and she had, she was friendly with Alfred Knopf, and uh, which was a real mainstream publishing company. And they published her, two of her books and it was like, you know, wonderful. And I think, even Nella lent Helen a dress or Helen lent Nella a dress for something. But the key thing here is that Nella was at least 20 or 15 or 20 years. Verna, how much older was Nella? Because you know that stuff. She was about, about 10 years older. 10, okay. And um, uh, when she realized that she could no longer earn a living as a writer, she went into nursing and I remember her talking to Helen about saying, you know, keep on writing, don't worry, dear. It's, um, it's a difficult thing to earn a living in. Uh, so she becomes a nurse, okay. And then she's a nurse at this hospital called General, Manhattan General. Fast forward, Helen comes in pregnant <laughs> and um, with a, a, a wife doctor and Francis Seymour. And uh, she, <laughs> and they look around and say, oh, there might be an issue. There might be a Bessie Smith issue here, which they were sort of, you know, uh, afraid might happen, but it didn't. And uh, so she gets in there and she sees Nella and Nella says, Shh, in a nice way. And, <laughs> and so she goes to the birth and at that time, having children without, um, Natural childbirth uh, was unusual. Uh, so so I, the reason I say that is because of, the pain was such that she quickly didn't care if it was Nella or not. Okay, next, fast forward, she's in the private room. They gave her a private room for free. Mm, that's nice. And Nella comes in with these flowers, and I'm delivering these flowers, and says, and Helen says, I, I saw you, but I didn't know what to say. And, and she said, that's right. Nella had to pass to get the, the gig as a nurse in the hospital. And she said, Helen, something like, I don't, because this is like a really long time ago. Oh, uh, how come? And I said, so how do you know that? That's what it was. How do you know that? And Nella said, uh, if you heard the things they said in front of me, you would know. And so that was Nella and Helen. And then, oh, golly, Nella lived moved eventually quite near that hospital on 20 some street, I don't know what, and died uh, alone in her hospital room in her apartment without, you know, chicken a child. So 
it can be a very lonely one. Sorry. Oh, well, yeah. give me another one. Give me a more cheerful one. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's uh, maybe transition from, from Nello to uh, uh, two other uh, like groundbreaking 20th century writers uh, who your mother had a, a deep and abiding relationship with uh, her cousin, Dorothy West, uh, and the, the painter, Lois Jones. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more about this trio's early escapades, as well as the different paths that their lives took. Okay. Um, Lois was, by the way, Lois, L-O-I-S, what we all call Lois, but she pronounces it Lois. Uh, she was different from the other girls because A, she had a father, and B, the father became a lawyer. He started off as a janitor, and then he became a lawyer, so that she, and they were, and, uh, their parents, just like Tracy's, kind of sort of, not really, um, were very supportive of her painting and would buy her, what do you call it, you know, paints and easels and stuff like that. They never said, you're not going to make it. They never said, become a nurse like Nella. <laughs> they never, you know, they were always very, very supportive of her. And then, <laughs> according to my mother, well, of course she has a very good uh a career, she married that good looking Haitian guy, and she did. The man was fantastic, and she introduced her to um, this uh, life. Uh, he, was a, he was some kind of Haitian diplomat, blah, 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 blah. but this life of, uh, that none of the other girls could have, of you know, going to Europe and meeting other diplomats and stuff like that. So it gave Lois a, not only a a colorful vision, a vision of, you know, color, fuse kind of color from Haiti, but also an entree into a life that uh, was good. Okay. Um, but when they were little, that's the deal. When they were, when I say they were little, I'm talking about three years old. They were friends for a long time. Um, they we're the best of chums and friends and stuff like that. It's, once again, except Lois was um, more aggressive than they. When Lois was at 14 years old, she, uh, she went to night, she was in high school. Uh, Helen, Helen and, and Dorothy went to Girls Latin and Lois went to some other school, but the thing, of, it wasn't as fancy as Girls Latin because Girls Latin was hard to get into. And Lois, um, after school, went to college for painting, for, for drawing things. And when she was 19, she had a one woman show. So, uh, so that was sort of the difference is that um, <laughs> when uh, the girls, and then when I say the girls, I mean Dorothy and Helen, uh, they were not as practical as Lois, no, and they had Rachel to deal with, right? Uh, the mother, and, um, and what else? That's enough. But they did, they were 19, it was 18 and 19, I think, when they came down for the opportunity thing, but they had to say that they were 16 and 17 or whatever, whatever age Rachel told them to lie about is what they, they said. But uh, uh, there was, okay, there was always a kind of friendly uh, competition. Lois taught at, at Howard for years and years and years. Um, and uh, my girls didn't. My girls didn't have that kind of stability. Sorry. Want more? You got another one? Give me another. Yeah, I, I've got another one. Already? Uh, yeah. Uh, since this is an, an oral history hosted by a Boston institution, I'm curious about the ways your mother remained a Bostonian uh, even after she moved to New York. And what were the foundational stories in some of them that she would tell about her Boston childhood? Oh, okay. She maintained her Bostonness because she didn't know how to cook. And so um, uh, uh, my whole life, I, uh, being in baked beans and uh, fish cakes, and that's it. I'm trying to think of other things. But the food 
was strictly Boston. And anyone else's mother and grandmothers knew they came from the South and they knew how to make greens and they knew how to make all these kind of swell things. And I don't know if she could do was open the can of beer and beans and put some you know, sugar in it uh, <laughs> and fish cakes. Uh, we never went to, no, that's not true. We, when we went to the vineyard, sometimes we would stop in Boston, but not much, maybe twice. The whole thing is that we always skipped Boston and went straight from New York to the vineyard and from the vineyard to New York. So I never really had that, that swan thing that they have at the park or all of those lovely um, Bostonian things that Helen would talk about. Oh, okay, so here we go. So we go to London, uh, all of us, um, and uh, <laughs> this is just like Boston. This is just like Boston. And without realizing that it was based on, on the stuff in, in, in Boston. Uh, I forgot your question already, but that was how she maintained her Bostonness, not through, not through, photographs. We don't have one photograph like in the whole, I don't have pictures of, of my graduating college. I don't have pictures of Helen and uh, we don't, we're just terrible about that. But um, the way most families keep like a family album or family recipes or all these kind of things, we were so small, lim limited. I don't know why we didn't, but we didn't. There you go. They, I don't know why we didn't, but we didn't. So we didn't really have that traditional that kind of familial tradition. All right, well, thank you for that. You, you mentioned the vineyard, and I'd actually like to, to uh, learn more about uh, Helene Summers in Oak Bluffs, and also about the African-American community that thrived on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, what did the vineyard mean to your mom? Uh, what did it make possible? Yeah, it was her whole life, pretty much. They would get out of school early in Boston in um, Back Bay? No, not Back Bay, Cambridge. Jason, where were they in Boston? Cambridge, right? R and, right. Then, and, and then go to uh, the vineyard early. Um, they always, okay. Oh, wow. I, I'm not even bunk, I have to now. Okay, so Archie, let's start at the beginning. Um, Rachel, the mother, uh, was a there must be a nice word for social climbing, but I don't know what it is. Whatever the nice word for social climbing is, she was. And so she took the kids when they were two years old and they bought a place on the vineyard. Um, right, it's, it's, uh, and on the water on the vineyard because she knew, and it was true, that's where she met Du Bois, that's where she met all those, it, it, it was a smart thing to do. <sighs> and they maintained that all, <laughs> until Ethel Waters burned the house down. And then <laughs> they didn't have it anymore. So they had to um, uh, move to a smaller house. Uh, and with that, uh, and the depression, and the end of the Harlem Renaissance, it sort of all came tumbling down. But until then, um, uh, all of this, some is, you no, know, she has a poem called The Road, and um, uh, I should know it, but I don't. But it's about this road that's the same, that this earth brown, is blah, blah, blah. And that road is the road in front of the house that I live in right now. So that, uh, that kind of history, geographical history anyway, um, gets under your skin, you know, you really, uh, you have an emotional attachment to something that's simply geographical. Uh, when we moved to New York, when she moved to New York so that I could be born, um, and if, if you turn your head, the, the house behind you would be torn down and a new one be put up. Uh, and she, the, one of the nicer things about 210 Thompson Street, which is where she uh, lived for a long time, is that that neighborhood was solid and it didn't gentrify as quickly as the others. But um, the, the feeling of home 
was really um, the vineyard more than it was Boston. Appian Way, wow. I just got the, that's the street they lived on in um, wherever they lived. Yeah, so that it and, it, and it has it for me and it has it for, for my children also. There's something magical about the vineyard that makes you think that's your primary home, you, you know. And, and even in my case, when I come from Brooklyn, I keep thinking of the vineyard as home. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, just moving right along, you, you mentioned the Harlem Renaissance. I'd like to focus the next few questions uh, on some of the people we think of when we say Harlem Renaissance and their relationship to your mother and her writing. Uh, might you talk a bit about Helene's friendship with Zora Neale Hurston? Uh, how did Helene and Dorothy come to be Zora's tenants in Harlem? Uh, what tales did you hear in those early New York days? Uh, and, uh, and how did their relationship evolve over the years. Oh, yeah, you got to do one at a time. Wait, wait, I can't, I can't <laughs> okay, uh, what's the first one? Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe how, how did uh, how did Helene and Dorothy come to be Zora's tenants? Okay, stop right there. Apartment. I got that one. I got it. Okay, stop there. <laughs> they met at the Opportunity Dinner, and Helen and Dorothy were staying at the Y because their parents gave them permission to come to New York City and, the, and stay at the Y because it was chaperone and go to the dinner and go home, all right? And uh, Zora was at that same dinner and Zora said, oh, you stay at the Y? Well, you know, I'm leaving on this archeological trip. Why don't you take my place? And rent it for a while and um, uh, it's cheaper than the Y. And they said, oh, okay, that's nice. And they called their parents up and they said, listen, we've been, um, there was a group of, of women called the Quill. They had this little, you know, reading poetry kind of, what we would call a book club today. And there's a, they, they, called, <laughs> they said, listen, the Quill, there's, a, there's a version of the Quill here in New York City, but that's not their action at the time. And, but they would have had that. And you know, could we stay a little longer, please? And we, you know, we're gonna, we really want to work on our, our literature, our writing. And they said yes, and they sent them the money to pay for the Y. Okay, so they had to keep the room at the Y because that's where they got the mail, and that's where the parents that they were staying. So then they go to um, Zora's, and Zora is like, like her bag's already packed. She's halfway out the door. And says, okay, I need three months rent in advance because you know I'm gonna be away a long time. <laughs> and so, okay, here you are, here's the money. And so it's out the door, and they're so happy, it's you know, pitiful. They're, they're away from Rachel, they're in their own apartment in New York City, and not only in New York City, and in Harlem, and downstairs, Fanshot Tone, and oh golly, another movie star at the time, we're playing poker. So it's, you know, wow, you couldn't ask for more than that uh, for the tweed, <laughs> the tweed suit girls. And, um, uh, <laughs> and uh, not the first night, but certainly a couple of nights later, they go, bam, bam, bam. Who is it? Oh, oh Zoe, we're, this is Heston Bridge. No, no, she's not here. We come for the rent. What are you talking about? We paid the rent. So, no, 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 no. So what was three months behind in the rent? You have to give us the money. Oh, we're gonna put you out and put your furniture out. <laughs> and so I know it sounds funny now. It wasn't very funny then. And Dorothy, ah, she was a big time crybaby. So um, they had their emergency money and they gave it to the guy. And so they, they they got the apartment, but they didn't have any money. So they said, Well, what are we gonna do? So oh, we have to get jobs. Jobs. And so they said, Oh shoot, we gotta get a job. And they did, and it went worked out fine. Actually, Dorothy wrote a piece about a few days after that ep episode, they're walking down the street and there are all these guys hanging out on the street. And so, oh, what's going on here? And uh, Helen says, oh, they're waiting for the parade. Parade, yes. So they, Helen, in order, don't forget Helen's a year older or nine months or whatever than Dorothy. So, She's got the responsibility. And she says, yes, yes, um, there's no doubt, you know, gonna be a parade. 
never occurred to them that they were in a depression. These guys are hanging out because they were unemployed. They didn't have any money. They were just hanging out on the street. Um, and, and that's sort of how Helen brought me up. I never occurred to me that I was the only poor person at the little schoolhouse. And, and you know, I, I get to walk home over the bridge because it's strengthened in my legs. So, so that kind of living, um, as opposed to having enough money for the subway is what I should have, I should have put that in. Um, and, and it was always cheerful and happy. Sorry, I, what was else? That was part one, here's, here's part two. Okay, yeah, did, did they uh, maintain their relationship? Uh, with, they uh, did with for a long, Sarah? long time. They did, uh, uh, once the phone came in, they stopped writing, 691J was the phone number in Oak Bluffs. And uh, they didn't write quite as much because they had the telephone, but they did keep writing and, um, and they, uh, they did not see each other very much. And when Helen did go on those a few, oh, Jean moved to the Cape, that's there you go. Jean moved to the Cape, so Helen would go to visit Jean and not Dorothy, and also Scotter, Ed Scotter. But Dorothy made it very difficult. Um, she made it difficult to be normal. You either defending yourself or, or in the basking in her, her, um, her world, but it was, it was, Darcy oh, made Helen feel like a failure and she didn't want to feel like that. And, but although it's her own fault, right? But, um, so she sort of didn't see her as much as she might have wanted to, but they did talk on the telephone. Okay. Next. All right. Yeah, we haven't discussed any of the uh, the male writers from the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Have at it. Yeah, maybe we can talk some about Langston Hughes. Uh, what was your your mother's relationship uh, with him uh, like? Uh, and well, Dorothy's uh, the one who was really friendly with Langston, and which is very strange because they were both gay, and they both said, and Dorothy kept thinking that you know, telling people they were going to get married. Because in those days it was bad to be gay, and um, and Langston wasn't having any of it. Uh, in fact, Langston wouldn't even publish his book unless uh, they said that he, he was gay. Uh, Dorothy didn't go that way, but um, I don't really know. Okay, no, wait, hold on, hold on. I would hear them talking about this guy named Langston. Don't think. Wait a oh, whole. Go back a little bit more. I didn't know what the Harlem Renaissance was. I didn't know that they were the meaningful poets. I, I didn't know any of that. I just knew that my mother worked for Consumer Reports as a um, uh, correspondent and that Dorothy uh, was living now. She was living, she had been working for the New York, for the New York Daily News, which was a really good job because she, got, she was a writer there and not as a journalist, but as a, uh, an essayist and then moved back to the vineyard. Okay, so I really, and they never told me, none of them told me what was going on. And so these names that I would hear, Zora and, uh, and Langston and Ellen and all, I realized now, oh, that's who they mean. You know, it's like, huh, anyway, um, I'm an, I forgot the question. What was, oh, so Langston, okay, so here we go. Langston was, um, Mm, mm, to, had this column in the Daily News called Sem Simple Simply, Simple Simply, well, how it was called. Then what, what was the name of the column? Simply the, 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 the best of simple, uh, Jesse B. Simple. Jesse B. Simple, right, right, mm -hmm. right. And I read it uh, and I thought it was awful because I thought he was demeaning black people and making black people talk in August. And um, and putting them down because I knew that Blanche, Blanche didn't talk like that. Uh, uh, but I never met him. And so then Helen says, <laughs> "Okay, 
Helen says, okay, Abigail, uh, Langston wants to meet you, or words to that effect. And he wants to have tea with you, and, and you should. And I said, okay, no. And she won't go with me. Aunt Jean's going to go with me. Now, Aunt Jean's the good looking one who's stupid, right? Stupid's the wrong word. Aunt Jean's the good looking one who is not, who was challenged. No, that's wrong too. Who is not as um, confident as the others are. Okay, but good looking and, and well dressed. <sighs> okay, so. Um, Helen was very famous for writing these letters that would get you introduced to people. And so I assumed, and she told me that she wrote the letter. So we get there and he lives in Chelsea and Jonathan, Jean is practicing his speech. Hello, this is, uh, I'm uh, 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 Eugenia Jordan. I'm the, co the, the cousin of Helene Johnson, the poetess. And I am have here, her, and she's like practicing and practicing. And she rings the bell and he says, who is it? And she says, it's the Eugene. And, I'm, and he goes like buzz and goes straight up without her giving his, her little speech. We get up the stairs and, um, and she does his speech, but she gets confused on the word poet. She wants to say poetess, but she says poetress, and then she like, does it over and over again. I'm like, ah, cringing, cringing, cringing. And he, he's, when, when she says Helen, Helen Johnson, he says, oh, wonderful. How is she doing? Blah, blah, blah. And um, it doesn't stop Jean. She keeps on going with the speech. I'm the cousin of, of, of Helen. Uh, and you know, right away, he was like so sweet to me. But he knew that I was in a compromised position and um, uh, said he wasn't prepared to receive us. And I said, oh, this is it. We're not getting any further than the, than the stairway. Uh, and turned around and went home. That was the only time I really met him face to face. I'd heard him on the phone. I'd passed the phone, but that was it. But what it did to me was I realized, how I made this up? She just said it because she realized that I should meet him um, since I was getting ready to go to college. And it would be like, you know, a good college reference or something like that. But it, it was very jarring and certainly memorable. Um, I don't, it, it's hard to say, but it, it makes me cringe. Thanks a lot, Vin, it makes me cringe. Okay, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> what, do you, what else you got? <laughs> Well, I think I want to focus a little on, on you, uh, Abby. Just maybe a couple more questions, and then we might go to the, the audience. But just a, a little about your life. Uh, you became an artist in your own right, and your creative life and artistic friendships have been such a remarkable extension of your mother's legacy. Uh, you attended the Bohemian Little Red Schoolhouse, as you mentioned. Uh, then uh, Bard College, where you majored in theater. You befriended Arnett Coleman, who set some of your mother's poems to music. Uh, you worked with Andy Warhol, and uh, you performed in the Off Center Theater. And most recently, as I understand it, you optioned film rights on a book. Uh, can you talk about some of these endeavors and also how, how your mother intersected with them? Okay, um, okay, let me, I, I, I sort of forgot the question, but I know that Eileen, <laughs> I saw that you wrote Chelsea Girls. I thought it was Chelsea Girls, the movie. And I said, oh, I, I never saw her at the factory. Yeah. Um, uh, I just stole the title. No, you, Ron, you wrote, a, you're a better writer than Ron. Ooh. Better than who? Uh, Ron Tavell, he wrote, he, he's the one who wrote it. He and Andy wrote oh, it. Oh, oh, yeah. But if it says Andy and, and anyone else, the other wh whoever the other person is, they did it. <laughs> and yeah. Andy, you know, hooked mm -hmm. on to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I can help, help out a little like, like, like Andy Warhol and Arnett Coleman. Could you uh, maybe talk about? Uh, okay. Uh, Arnett was, how did I meet him? Okay. I was, I owned hat check concessions. Uh, in Greenwich Village, and Ornette um, was get, had been a, a, away for two years. He hadn't played for two years, and he was going to make his come back 
at where, uh, what was the place? What was the name of the place? Oh, golly. Jason, are you there? No. Oh, big club. In, uh, Max Gordon owned it. Anyway, uh, at this nightclub. And um, so that's all. Oh, no. Oh, shoot. Oh, come on, Vernon. All right, here we go. I first met on, no. The Village Vanguard? That's it. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. So um, I own the hat check concession there. But I have to go back a little bit more. At the five spot, which is a big, a big well-known jazz club, um, I went there with a bunch of white people. This is important to note because white people thought jazz was just wonderful. And um, Ornett was playing there. And it was after they had um, uh, melted his sax saxophone. His, he had a plastic saxophone that people got so angry with him that it, they melted it. Um, and it, atonal music had just been, no, that's not true. They've been, they, they, they've been, they've been did atonal music. But it was just coming into play. And all these real serious, you know, Leonard Bont Bernstein and people like that were coming down to hear Ornett play atonal jazz. And it's like really, no kidding around, genius kind of stuff. OK, so fast forward. I am, now I have the hat check concessions. And one of them is the Village Vanguard. And Ornett's coming to play, because he's been away for a long time. And he's like the big time headliner there. Um, but, and I'm the hat check girl. Uh, and I have all these smart girls working for me because I, I only know smart girls. Um, and come to find out that Ornette likes to talk smart talk. And his wife was a big time poet. And um, he, oh wow. Uh, he, he had a thirst, an intellectual thirst. So we became really terrific friends. And he found out that Helen was a poet and he lived uh, in the village and asked to see some of her poems. And I said, sure. And next time I saw him, he's going to do, 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 to Helen's poems. And then they, they had a relationship between the two of them that I wasn't really a part of because I was stupid. I didn't know that good could happen. And also, no, no, let me put it the other way around. Both of them were so eccentric that it never occurred to me that this is something that I should uh, organize and make sure they write it down and you know know what um, what's going on. So that that was the two of them. And um, Donato, his son, went to same same school as Jason, except Donato was a little younger. So that's Helen and Ornette. He was the only, Helen didn't know Andy. Um, he, she was friends with um, Alan. Come on, Alan. Ginsburg. That's the one. Thank you. Uh, uh, and, and they got along quite well, except Helen didn't wasn't keen on all that cursing because she thought it took away from the. Um, the meat of the of the work, and it was like uh, drawing attention to itself instead of to the the purpose. Uh, so I knew Andy on my own. I didn't. Helen had was not uh, uh, a part of the Andy crowd. Um, Andy, um, I knew Andy. I don't remember how I knew. Oh, so the for Max's. Oh, that's right. I I own the Max. At Max's Kansas City was a uh, an in crowd type place, and I owned the hat check and sessions there as well as I was the bouncer. And so when and I was very friendly with Mickey Weskin, who who owned the place. My friend Johanna. Oh, okay. So Johanna Lawrenson, whose mother Helen Lawrenson, you guys might know, she won uh, Whistling Women and uh, Latin to Love, uh, Latin to Lousy Lovers. And she was the editor of Vanity Fair. I remember I told you the story about, um, what's the guy who was the editor, the, the publisher of Vanity Fair? John uh, Trunstein, I believe. No, no, no. Uh, it'll come to me. No, the one that, that was wanted to be friendly with Helen. At Vanity Fair. 
EF. I think it was uh, Tronstein. No, no, it'll come to me. Anyway, no. um, so Mickey Ruskin thought that since I own these other ones, that I, other hat concessions, that I knew what I was doing, bless his heart. And I didn't, but that was, um, there were so many people coming in and out. Oh, so many, you know, and, and, and Lou, Lou uh, Reed wrote that song um, about me and Nirwana and the colored girls go do, 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 do. So it was a nice time to be in. And Andy had the back room. Okay. And um, uh, so I knew him as an outsider. There you go. I was not part of that crowd. I always had to go home and take care of Jason. And I wasn't that part of that crowd because I never did drugs. I didn't even drink. Um, and that was a part of the culture at the time, which is uh, not, neither good nor bad. It was just part of the culture. Uh, however, I, you know, they knew who I was and I knew who they were. So, um, when they needed stuff, because I was also had a job as a copywriter, and I also, had, I, you know, a typical black woman always has three or four jobs. Um, and we became friendly. Oh, I know, I know how we got to be friends. Okay, here we go. Uh, I had a, another friend named Pierre Schneider, who was a big time Matisse um, expert. And he wrote for L'Express, he wrote the um, art thing for, and that's how I know John Asbury, okay. So um, he, uh, Andy, there was, Keith Harding was just making a big deal uh, on, on graffiti. Not, I don't know what's called, street art, street art. And uh, Andy asked me to meet him down there to look at some stuff because he didn't really want me to be there. He wanted uh, Pierre to be there, but he didn't know how to say, bring your friend with you. So, um, he had to sort of trust me. And uh, that's how that started. Eventually they did get together, but first he had to, you know, get, you gotta get through me first. All right, next. All right, I've got like one final question and then okay. we'll go to the audience for some, some Q and A. Uh, might you tell us uh, what, what was it like to hear from your mother's neighbor in the midst of the pandemic <laughs> about the discovery of some lost things? Yeah, it was a it was a really drop dead on the floor moment. Um, and not only that, because earlier someone had found some. I think Richard Rice's works were found like in someone's kitchen or something. Uh, and then Matthew, I don't is if Matthew's on asking. To, I don't remember. I don't think he called me. I think he sent me an email from Renaissance House. Oh, I have a retreat for writers called Renaissance House, and that's online. So that it's easy to get me to do that. And I think that's how Matthew find me, but I'm not, you know, I'm not all that good at that. And he said, listen, during the pandemic, I was cleaning out my closet and I have all these poems. Are you related to Helene Johnson? Duh, bang. And, and, that, and that's how it happened. And Matthew is, you know, what's the right way to put this one? Uh, the kindest, nicest person ever to walk the earth. So, and, and oh, oh, okay. And she would tell me about him, but not saying his name, but her wonderful neighbor who would get him milk and things like that, that she needed um, and how swell he was. Uh, and then I put, eventually, I put two and two together. And I said, wait a second, this guy on the phone is the same guy that's in that poem. He's 22 on 63. So, oh my goodness gracious. And I shut my mouth because I didn't want to, you know, seem rude, but it was a revelation. That's the best word I can do. I'm done. All right, thank you, Abby. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah. Well, we can go to, uh, go to the audience now. If you would, uh, can you use the, the raised hand icon? And I'll just call on you. And I'm looking.
Oh my goodness, nobody? Like Rachel. Like Rachel has a question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm unmuted right now. Oh, I must have missed a beat, but I really want to know very badly, where are these papers? That is, where are the poems, what archive they're in? Um, you didn't miss a beat at all. <laughs> they, uh, I, uh, my friend Tana and I got them all together and we put them in those comic book sleeves, right? And right. there's an, an archivalist uh, who has the uh, Dubois Center for Learning in Great Barrington, got Randy Weinstein, and he knows how to do this stuff because we didn't know how to do it. And he, God bless this man, he came and took it all and organized it and so uh, and copied it so that it's not lost forever. And it's coming back here. And if the real question is, why have we not given it to a library? It's because when we gave the first batch to um, the Schomburg, it occurred to me that no one's ever going to see this. This is going to sit in that old dark, dusty room, and it'll never be seen. So I'm trying to find a way so that that it can be distributed in such a manner that that people get to see them because her eye for um, thought, you know, there's two kinds of writers. One has uh, good thoughts and the other has good words. And Helen's, you can see in, in the iterations of, of each of her, her pieces, how much time and thought she put into the words, but also into a, a thought. Her, the, the, she has a poem about war that she wrote in, I don't know, when did she write that one? Because then I'm not good at days. But and it's so contemporary uh, that you know it, it just jumps jump out of your seat. You say, you know, where's your fiscal logo? Uh, that kind of mind and together with putting it in those kind of words should be heard and and right. and not yeah. I'm sorry. Right. No, no, I totally agree, and I'm a big uh, fan of. Her, the poems that were around. So are you planning to maybe make an anthology of this new work where obviously with, by giving it to, you know, this particular bundler, you're trying to sell it to an archive? That's, is that what you're saying? No, I'm too stupid for that. Don't, I'm, I'm, <laughs> don't, don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am, I am. Uh, I would rather, okay, you know, I'm a girl in the 60s and the 70s, I mean, I'd like to like put them on the subway station so that people could read them when they're going to work or um, I don't know. Uh, people don't read anymore anyway. So I, I, I really don't know what to do with them. Uh, and in the end, of course, I'll, 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 I'll donate them to send any archival thing. But if they could be published and seen, not, yeah. in addition to regular poems, poet, people who write poetry, but to people who, who like rap music and to people who like can chance the rapper or Ken Ma, whatever Lamar, whatever you know, Kendrick Lamar, um, just a, a just there is mechanisms. <laughs> there are mechanisms. I said there are mechanisms that are called publishers, as you undoubtedly. I mean, come on, we'd love to see this work. I mean, I'm right, like, yeah, well, right now, <laughs> did I'll somebody talk. just put up, Nancy Burke just put up a note, digital archive, broadsides, another person. I'm going to mute myself now because I'm getting too- Don't mute yourself. Send it to me. Send it to me and I'll do it. Send it to me and I'll do it. I, I think Christina should be in charge of that. She's the You're boss. You're in charge, Christina. This is my subliminal way of making this all happen. This is, this is how That's I work. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Abigail, I might be jumping the line, but I was curious about, um, I've never quite understood, did your mother cease publishing? She clearly, through all this, we're, we're clearly discovering that she persisted in writing, and it's very moving to me, the ways in which writing evolved and, and, and sustained her during her life. But, but th was there a moment where she did give up? Publishing or um... the the business of publishing, right? That's what we're talking about. And yeah. yeah, yeah, she did give up on that, and I couldn't help because I don't know diddy squat about publishing, and I still don't. Um, but you know, it's one thing to write to make the mud pies, but to sell it, mm, so it's a whole new world um, that. 
she didn't know the world that she was in. And I don't know the, the computer world that I'm in. I don't, and I don't, you know, there are no more books. There's so, very few bookstores. I don't know how this whole new publishing thing works. So send me an email and I'll do it. I'm, I'm very good at following instructions. You talked about being one of the few children that was born um, out of the Harlem Renaissance, or one of the, one of the first, her, your mom is being one of the few women who had a child. Does that give you a unique perspective or maybe the only perspective? Is one the of only the perspective, right? <laughs> Take my way or the highway. No, I wish I had someone to hang out with. Um, Bruce Nugent had a whole bunch of kids, but that was before he was um, in the, uh, I'm in the, I'm in the, the a writer. Um, I think Augusta Savage had some kids, but she's a sculptor, so she doesn't count. I don't know of any of them <laughs> who were straight or any of them who had children. So uh, do you? No, I hadn't really thought about it, to be perfectly frank, until you, you spoke yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Georgia Douglas Johnson, the uh, the DC poet, had a couple of sons, but she she was a bit older though than uh, yeah. than your mother. So it's not easy being green, uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons that the movement didn't go on any further after the um, depression because there was no second generation. So. So it looks like Brenda Dixon has a question. Oh. Brenda, would you Hello. like to unmute? Brenda? Yes, Abby, oh, it's Brenda no. Dixon Gottschild now. <laughs> I have oh, to sorry. But you know that I, I just got an email from um, Rebecca today. Wait, who is Rebecca? Rebecca Davis, Rebecca who lives in Clearwater, Florida. Oh my goodness, okay. I know, that's just too small a world. No, just for people to know, Abby and I go back to our days at West Beth in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a dance scholar and historian, but Abby and Tony, right after I gave birth to my daughter, Amel. Abby, you came over and brought me a casserole of uh, cabbage and, and corned beef and cabbage. <gasps> very, very African-American. <laughs> I told you that. Yeah, I don't know. And then Abby and Tony invited me to be uh, in uh, the off-center theater. <laughs> so that was quite a wonderful, this is so wonderful to see you again. And, and you know that, Brenda, that we named the character in um, Hope for Life, Amel, because you said it was Hope, right? Oh and my goodness, Hope. I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't know that. This is all so beautiful and so okay. wonderful the way things come around. That's and had terrific. We had a soap opera. We had a, we did a soap opera on the streets um, yeah. about yeah. corporate America, and the the woman, the, the lead the protagonist, was a young woman, and her first name was uh, Amel because of uh, that's my daughter's daughter. name. Yeah. Oh, so anyway, wonderful to be here. Great to see you again, Abby. And I didn't oh. know about your incredible Brahmin credentials back then. Well, we don't we don't talk about things like that. Uh -huh. But listen, Brenda, we're having a reunion, and if you send me your email address, I would love to invite you to that. I'm going to put it in the box. Thank right? you. Oh, Thank wonderful! You. It looks like Eileen's raised her hand. Oh, good. I have a couple of questions. Well, one is, um, I wonder, I wonder if Helene did she keep journals? No. Oh, that's crazy. What else Flat that out, no. And worse than that, like, worse than that, is uh -huh. that she would have like a shopping list and then have like little notes of poetry next to, you know, lamb chops. Okay, uh, where is, you know, I mean, it's just uh -huh. awful. Just terrible. Okay, did next snag, question. Did you snag those shopping lists or? No, who knew? I didn't know until I was oh. going through the stuff. I said, no. 
right 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 and yeah, and yeah. so so were you aware at all of her writing in that time when she was your mom and you were growing no. up i mean you kind of knew she had a poet past right i kind of knew that they were all writers and that they had poet pasts but i didn't know the significance of it and then you had no awareness of her having any kind of writing process in that time when you were growing up okay yeah no that's not true that's uh, i lied a little bit she was working on a play in verse huh. and um and i remember that because everything rhymed and it, it was i don't even remember what the play was about but i remember saying "Ooh, this is hard to do to mm -hmm. make um a whole play in verse but that's the only thing i remember and after that when she became ill and she lived with me then she was i, I was well aware because she would write in bed yeah Mm -hmm. But while growing up, that was the only thing I remember. Wow. And this poem here, the poem I read, I mean, I didn't read to the end, and I had no idea who Jason was, of course, and Jason's in the poem. Yeah. Uh, and so Jason's when, in the house. Do you know when yeah. she wrote this poem? Like, when is the boat is tethered to the floor is from? Do Amel, you know? do you know? Amel, do you know? Yeah. Uh, he does. I, he does I'm know. not sure. Oh, I'm not, not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Neither not am sure. I. Okay, there was a big um, cache uh, of her stuff. And I, I don't do chronology well, and I don't remember, but I remember Patterson, when then she was hanging out with uh, um, um, Raymond, Raymond Patterson. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he collected a bunch of stuff. And that's the stuff that they took to the Congress, but somehow I had copies of it or something. And that, you know, if it hadn't been for Emily, nobody would know about it. But well, Abigail, you know how old Jason might have been, maybe? That's what I was going to say. Jason sounded like they were a baby in this poem. So when was that? So, well, that would be, uh, he was born in 61, so that would be before the 70s. Like, yeah, huh. Yeah. So, and she died in 95, so she was probably 70 when she wrote this. Okay, I'll go like, with that. And that's when the movie yeah. came out. Very good. What's the movie? Yeah. I Which forgot the name of it. I'm so sorry. The, the, the little old, a French title. And oh, the French movie. movie yet yeah, that we wanted. Yeah, we'll get it. I know we got to research. Our team has to figure out what that French movie was. Because oh it, yes, it's it's a movie like, and a half. Sounds yeah. like a great movie, and it is interesting to look at. And one more question: Did she have a Boston accent? Yes. That because was I know, when I read it, I was like, "This, you know, every Boston poet, you can find the accent in the poem at some point." That's and I was like, when she was like. Hoist me Allah while I am moist in a jaw. So this in is a jaw. Right. Ah, it was like that's about that's what but I. But she thought. had two Boston accents. One her regular, you know, Boston accent, and then when she put on the Boston, which oh, was an upper class Boston accent. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. But I think that's a Boston accent to do that. That's code switching within Boston, All right? Yes. Yes. Totally. Wow. Interesting. So was there this hunger at the end of her life to get published? You were telling me something about where she or you helped send something to Ginsburg. Ginsburg was going to try to do something for her. That related That's to right. The Kaplan Foundation fund funded Ginsburg's organization called COPS, Committee on Poetry. And uh, they were uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. they were going to um, publish something. And so they got Patterson to collect all the stuff. And somewhere in the mix there, nothing happened. So that's that's where we that's where we got the ma the, the manuscript through Bob oh, from Alan. Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. From Alan, yeah. Right. And well, so did she hang out with Alan in the village or they no, were both Helen doesn't, Helen doesn't hang out. Remember oh, I told oh. you about that shy, arrogant thing? No, she never left the house, but she would like it when you banged on her door and <laughs> asked mm -hmm. to have a, an audience with it. Um, uh, then she did a lot of phoning. She did a lot of, she, she would talk on the phone, but not a lot. She really, but I, and I'm making fun of her, but no, she re, she was really shy. No kidding around shy. Crippling shy. Right. I have a recollection. Can you hear me, um, Abigail? I can. Who is it's this? Annette. That's Annette. Okay. I can, I know Annette. Go ahead. Hi, hi. I have a recollection. I went to um, Abigail's house to visit and her mother was there and she was the nicest, 
person to a stranger. And she'd say, oh, hello, darling. And I mean, I, that's not, not that voice, obviously. But she was just so kind and so, and so soft and so mellow. And I said to Abigail the other day, I said, I don't remember. I don't remember your mother. And then I went to sleep last night. And when I woke up this morning, I totally remembered your mother. It was like in my sleep, she said, what, what do you mean you don't remember? And so Abigail, I had the nicest visit with your mother when she was at your house. The nicest. Thank Baby, you. so well. Yeah. And that's what yeah. that's that that's, has a lineal thing because she's really kind to everybody. I never got a spanking ever in my life, all because of that um, poignant background child, as a child that she had. But being kind to people and trying to make them feel better under any circumstances was uh, that was her MO. Thank you, Annette. Oh, and that's also wait, wait, wait. and that's also an off center theater. And Annette, I just saw Brenda, and she said she's going to hook us up with her for the for the reunion. Oh, okay. wonderful! Thanks, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any other questions? I don't have questions, ah. but I have, oh, go ahead. Somebody should go ahead. I just had more thoughts. Oh um, yeah. Ooh, me. I'm, yeah, this was great. Thank you, Christina, for setting this up. And thank you, Abby and, and Werner. This is tremendous. Uh, the chapbook that we did remains one of our absolute favorite projects. So uh, I just wanted you to know that. And people love it. And you would be surprised at how much it has circulated. So all of this is to say that if you want us to do a selection of the new poems, we will do it in a heartbeat. Oh, terrific. So <laughs> sure. we'll that was easy. <laughs> that was easy. Exactly, exactly. I don't know how to raise my hand on Zoom, but I'm raising my actual hand, but I'm Liz Benedict. Hi, Abigail. Oh, hello, hello, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, I have, of course, I'm happy to see you and be here and hear all about your mother and the world that she was in and you were in. I have kind of um, uh, two questions. One is, um, what did what did did you learn? Did, was, does your did your mothering your children have anything to do with her mothering you? I mean, did you were you the kind of mother to your kids the the way she was a mother to you? No, I could never be the mother to my kids as she was to me, and worse than that. I kept saying, well, I have boys. I have to make them independent. And so I would say, um, you know, <laughs> uh, you, oh, you're scared? Well, you don't have to hold my hand. You, you know, be, stuff like that, but not for long. Uh, I always had Helen at the back of my mind in, in how to raise a child, but I'm just not as good as she was. I'm simply not as good a mother as she was. Sorry. Can you say, I mean, I don't want you to say that you're not as good, but say what mm. you mean, because you had her in the back of your mind as what? As, as, the, as that's how, that's what a mother should do. She'd make all, Helen was a martyr. Uh, you know, the woman had like 12 jobs so I could go to private schools. Mm -hmm. um, she never thought of herself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't realize that until lately, because as I said, I didn't know that we didn't have any money. I mean, I knew we didn't have any money, but I didn't know we didn't have any money. So I see now the things that she did um, that I didn't do. Uh, and, and I didn't have to do as much because mm -hmm. each generation gets a little bit better. But um, mm, I don't, I know the, th the uh, her devotion to me, okay, here we go. Her devotion to me was so strong. And I, and I, can, I saw it then, and it was, you know, it was never annoying, but it was, you know, palpable. And uh, now I realize that, wow, 
that's not kidding around. And I never could be as um, uh, that as I'm a half-assed martyr, but not as good as Helen was. Not as good as Helen. No, oh, I beg to differ, but, but, <laughs> uh, but I make the effort. I make the effort. How's that? Okay. Luvan uh, uh, Roberson has a yeah. question. Oh, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth had a second question. Well, I, I just wanted to pick up on um, what Mr. Mitchell was saying, asking you about the vineyard and the African American community there, because I know something about it from you know you and being there. But how you know how uh, that influenced you growing up? Oh yeah, not at all. I, I um, it, the influence is the key word here, and I I just took it for granted. It was not. An, an influence on me. Uh, and don't forget the vineyard's very laid back. Contrary to, um, what's the name of the, the TV series that's on right now? My Kind of People is so, some kind of, some dreadful show about the vineyard. That's totally untrue. But, um, the, and the vineyard is, you know, is pure Helen. Everyone, you're sitting to, next to a, 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 a Pulitzer Prize winner and you'd never know it. You're just having a swell time. And nobody dresses, and and so I guess the influence on me was um, to always look at people for what they are or come across are, and not be not to be impressed. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm saying this all the wrong way, but what counts is you for me the the sense of relaxation and, you know, I don't want to say the cliche things, but oh, I'm with my own people and blah, blah. That's not true. What's really true is I have a chance to, um, to, <laughs> this is a cliche, be at one with myself so I don't feel as if I'm missing out on anything um, that's, uh, economically, socially, or, or, or any other. But I have to say that Elizabeth was one of the early lecturers at Renaissance House. And um, Elizabeth's a fantastic writer. And uh, I'm very grateful for our moments together. Thank you, Abby, me too, of course. Uh, move on. Yes, thank you, Abigail. It's so wonderful to see you and to be amongst this member. This Luvon, number. is that you? That's Luvon? It is. It's oh me. Oh my God, I recognize your voice. Oh, hey, hi, hey. Hi, I just wanted to say, well, sort of ask, say, <laughs> it's, it's tying in about Martha's Vineyard and about um, how so few of the Harlem Renaissance um, icons mm -hmm. um, maybe didn't reproduce biologically. And I'd love you to talk about Renaissance House because that is DNA of so much. <laughs> yeah, you like that? You taught me. I like me. that. That was you good. You taught me. You taught me. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Okay. Helen and Dorothy both had really, really uh, economically difficult lives. Although you never know it from the outside, right? Dorothy worked as a cashier at a restaurant in Edgartown now and, and held her head up high. And Helen works as a report, as a correspondent, as told her some reports. But uh, what they, neither one of them had was what Virginia Woolf said everyone should have. It's a room of your own and um, a few shekels from your father and time to write. And, and, and that, that was in the, the first questions I, I, I spoke to uh, Tracy and Eileen about it. What makes you stop writing is that you have to work and to earn a living. Um, so when um, uh, Helen died and um, and people said things like, well, should we send flowers? Uh, I said, no, I want to make a nice little retreat for writers. And all I have to, I have to do is, um, show up and um and so I, I i tried to fashion this this cozy safe place 
that a, a person can take a chance in writing. That's an, oh, this is important. Okay. So that if you have been writing, you know, academic stuff, now you can take a chance and really fly and, and, and do things that you might not want uh, normally do. Um, and, um, and, and, and so that's why I did Renaissance House so that all they have to do is, you know, you, you feed them, you, you cushy cushy them and, and they sleep there and, and, and for the, for, they don't have to worry about their telephone bill or, or um, electricity getting turned off. It's just, it's what, what I wish that I'd had. It, and what the, the girls have, when I say the girls, I mean Dorothy and Helen, that they have a place, a safe place to write and not have to worry about the outside world. And, and so that's, that's why I did it. And Sandra Grimes? Ah, hi, Sandy. <laughs> Sandy, you're on mute. mute. She doesn't know she's on mute. She doesn't know she's on mute. Tell us. Okay. There you so go. So Abigail, this is a fabulous conversation. Well, and uh, it's so lovely, lovely that uh, everyone put this together. So part of what I was going to ask was asked by the last person. And I think uh, I'm interested in the legacy that you leave behind and also the legacy that was inspired by your mother and her cohort, all those wonderful literary <laughs> women. And so if you could talk some more about that, and if you could sort of um, condense it into something that you feel is the most important thing that you can leave behind. Oh, no, you know, con condensation is not what I do best, Sandy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, mm, 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 mm. Okay. The thing that, okay, so you say, okay, when you get a certain age, you say, okay, what am I going to leave behind? Uh, uh, how am I going to make the world a better place? Uh, what's her name? Elizabeth, the woman who wrote uh, Little Lord Fontoy, I think. Anyway, and that's your goal. Okay, so um, I was married to a man who was um, different from the other men, but and magical and swell, uh, uh, but taught me that giving stuff, you give away the stuff you love and you charge for the stuff you don't too much care about. And so we gave away theater, we did it free in the streets. And, um, and then when Helen and Dorothy died, I thought, hmm, okay, I'm gonna have a retreat for writers to come to. And, and, and I, I know I'm, I keep saying the same thing over and over, but there should be a way for people who write to be able to live uh, without having another job. And, and uh, before I go, before I leave this earth, I would like to try to figure out some kind of way to do that. That's the legacy I hope to leave. I probably will leave debts, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Eileen, I, I see your hand up. Mine's just a quickie. You said in passing, Abigail, that Ethel Waters burned the house down? Yeah. And what is, tell me, me, let's, can we hear that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Rachel's daughter's mother uh, was, I saw you look, big time, you know, uh, social climate. And that's the wrong word, but, you know, she advanced herself socially and would have these big parties. And uh, at the time, smoking, women were not allowed to smoke legally. Legally, women were not allowed to smoke. But they had just said, okay, now you can smoke. Sort of, kind of. Anyway, it was like, no. But classy women didn't smoke and trashy women did smoke. All right, so they have one of these parties and Ethel Waters, a uh, well-known actress, in case you don't know who she is, she's, um, mm, I'll do that afterwards. So she's in the porch. Okay, so the, the house is on the water and the porch is on the sand on the water. And so Ethel's out there smoking and Do Rachel's inside. Mm, she, 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 she smells the smoke, she goes outside and she yells at Ethel. 
So you can't smoke here, blah, 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 blah. Ethel flips the cigarette into the water. Done. Okay, because everyone's scared of Rachel. Ethel Waters was scared of Rachel. And so uh, <laughs> Rachel goes back inside and Rachel, Ethel lights up again. No sense at all. And uh, now she hears Rachel coming. And so she stuffs it down in the, the planks of the porch, you know, the, how the porch has a little thing in between and nothing happens. And so that, not, and then they go home, everyone has a wonderful time and she doesn't get caught the second time. And that night, the whole house goes up in flames. And it's right next door to Lois's house. They stand the same duplex. And which is, if you know the island, it's where um, our market is now. Uh, and the whole, uh, and really scary to the point where Helen at, oh, I don't know, 80, 90 years old, always kept a flashlight near her in case there would be a fire. That's the big imprint that it had. Um, and because they were black, they couldn't get insurance. So uh, good times were over and they um, got the little house up on, on the hill. Uh, but uh, Ethel never got caught. So, uh, and, and that's how she burned the house down. Thank you. <laughs> One more question? What do you think, Werner? I'll um, be short. I'll take one question. I'll really answer it quickly. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I've been really enjoying this program a lot. I don't usually go on Zoom. I find I just for whatever reason, but this uh -oh. seems like a very special one to me. Uh, and the talk that you just gave and also the readings before at the beginning. Um, I just had two little moments that I was just thinking about. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to share any impression you had since you mentioned Andy Warhol. I wondered if you had any impression of Warhol that you wanted to share. What's you the, let me, give them both at the same time. What's the other one? Oh, the other one actually has to do. I thought you mentioned John Ashbery, and I, I, I did. Imagine how that would figure in, and I was wondering where he figured in your narrative, if anywhere. Okay, I don't have a narrative, so that's cool. Well, I mean, you're, right. I mean you're <laughs> let's start with. Um, uh, I forgot the first. What was the first question? Uh, mm -hmm. Your impression of Andy Warhol. Oh, my impression. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he, terrific businessman. And um, and and the thing about all those guys is they actually do have skills and uh, they do have thoughts and um, and putting those thoughts and those skills together is a talent. But Andy's talent was really business, and he was fearless, absolutely fearless, and um, and uh, opportunistic. Oh, Lord have mercy, I'm never going to work again. But the man, you could be an ax murderer. But if you were famous, he would hang out with you. Because um, <laughs> being uh, important was almost as, um, uh, equiv as attractive, you know, as, um, you notice, yeah, as, uh, as being smart. Okay, the second question was, I forgot, what was the second question? Because we're running out of time. You're, you mentioned John Ashbery's name. And oh, I'll... John Ashbery. John Ashbery was at Times, and wow, he was friends with my friend Pierre Schneider. Uh, actually, John Ashbery, I think, took Pierre Schneider's job at the Times. Um, and I don't know, we just like would hang out and have lunch together and stuff. Good stuff like that. I once, okay, there's another stupid Abbey story. I had no idea that he was famous. Or, or, or what for, and, and Pierre didn't tell me because you don't have to tell me because you know, I'm not gonna remember anyway. But um, it, it was uh, uh, not until way later that I, I, I realized who he was. And actually it's a good thing because I, you know, I would have I put on the Boston or I would have showed off or I would have not been my regular my wonderful show myself. <laughs> so I, I'm actually grateful that I didn't know who he was. But Thank you know that Cynthia has his typewriter. Did you know I, that? I do. Hiding? Yeah. 
Don't Astro you have Cat a typewriter? Yeah, but I'm not Cynthia, but hey. You know. Oh, Christina. <laughs> I was trying to read your thing. I thought it said Christina. I'm so sorry. I mean, I thought it said Cynthia because it started with a C. I'm sorry, Christina. All games are, all names are optional. No, I can't um, see this little tiny print here. It's giving me a very hard time. Um, what do you think? Should we, we, we did have a finale film I wanted to show. I Very want to great. see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we'll have a moment uh, in which maybe um, after the movie, we'll unmute our mics and thank everyone. But this is just a brief film that um, was created for this occasion by Boston poet, musician, and documentarian John Mulrooney. And it has the voices of two amazing Boston poets that you will see and hear on the screen. Let's let it roll. Forgive me for being selfish and self-centered. You gave me most of your young and very important day and I did not seem grateful. I never seem grateful, but somewhere down deep, I am. Do it you like with the Xerox. Never interrupt your work again. God knows what you might have created Work, work, work. At the height of the COVID shutdown, Matt Imperial wrote to Abigail McGrath to inform her that he'd recently discovered 118 pages of her mother Helene Johnson's poems, which he'd long thought lost. Abigail replied with characteristic gusto, Glorioski. Give me a moment or two to get up off the floor. Matt and Helene first met in the late 1970s as residents of the same seven-floor walk-up near Washington Square Park. Imperial had recently moved to the village to become a painter and was unaware, at least at the time, of Johnson's groundbreaking early work and her role in the Harlem Renaissance. They were simply neighbors in that generous, intimate anonymity that great cities make possible. They spoke frequently in each other's doorways, on the front stoop, and in her kitchen, where from her writing desk she would have seen the recently completed Twin Towers. As their friendship deepened, Johnson would sometimes ask her young neighbor to Xerox her poems, and shortly before moving away, she entrusted a collection of them to him with the hopes that he might one day find them a publisher. From that time until her death in 1995, they corresponded, and she often sent him poignant and quizzical poem letters, akin to the epistolary fragments of Emily Dickinson. Of course, had it not been for you, I would have given it all up. Meanwhile, I want you to have these. I like to feel the little floating failures have a home. Thank you. And even at 73, who knows? Helen Hubble. Matt has remained in the building long after Johnson's death and the collapse of the towers. And during this year of renewed crisis, having unearthed Helen's gift to him, he has sought to fulfill his promise. Thanks to his efforts and the steadfast dedication of Abigail McGrath, it is our honor to give a selection of these poems and drafts a long-awaited airing. Hurry! Before the moon becomes part of the establishment, the same people in the park, the overwrought, sitting on torn benches, smiling endlessly at kids, vaulting the puddled sky. The same people halted, the same following stare, the caught thought, residual people written off, not quite remembering, carefully forgotten, in the timbered park. Unbouncing people who wait and watch, relentlessly,
for the unspeakables in chalk, always unpartnered, always apart. Reluctantly mounted on the same benches in the same park. Wish you were here. To skip stones with me before I walk the plank into this moment's sea. If I bring a flower and get there at a genteel hour with my coffee mug and my napkin ring and amusing stubble on my chin, will you let me in? Swim, fish, drift. Each day is loosely stitched and has your name on it. Please unmute your mics and just uh, shout out your thanks to wow. Abigail and Werner and Eileen and Tracy and Tony and Danielle and John. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, McConaughey. Thank you, neighbor. Love you. Wonderful work. Thank you. Well, Thank you, neighbor. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Thank you, Abigail. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful visit. Lovely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't want to get out of here. Abigail. Let's all meet up on the vineyard. Yes. yes. Yeah. Lobsters on, on the subway. <laughs> <laughs> on the subway. You can do that. Right. Oh. You're going to go lobsters, Abigail. You're in trouble now. Right. <laughs> well, we'll catch ourselves. <laughs> There's Matt, Thanks. Imperial. Thank oh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you.